Hello and welcome to the latest edition of our podcast series. My name is Ian Kennelly and I am historian in residence with Westmead County Council. Today we are going to talk about Lawrence Kennell, who was born in Delvin County Westmead in 1852. In this episode we are going to concentrate on Gunnell's political career from 1908 onwards, but I will first give you a brief summary of his life and career to that point. Gunnell married Margaret Wolfe of Listowel, County Kerry in 1882, but she died in childbirth the following year. In 1902, he married Alice King of Kilbride, Mullingar County, Westmead. Alice would become a talented political organiser for both Sinn Féin and Cumannamon, and she would work closely with Lawrence during his career, acting as his election manager on at least one occasion. By the turn of the 20th century, after working as private secretary to the prominent nationalist politician John Dillon, the self-educated Lawrence Gunnell had qualified as a barrister. Gunnell worked as a paid secretary at the offices of the newly formed Irish nationalist organisation the United Irish League for a number of years until his election to the British House of Commons in 1906 representing North West Mead. In the autumn of that year he launched the Ranch War, the last major agrarian agitation in Ireland before the revolutionary period. In 1907 he was imprisoned in Kilmainham Jail and released in 1908. Between 1908 and 1909, support for the Ranch War faded amongst the higher echelons of the Irish party, while at the same time Gunnell was accused of splitting the party, a state of affairs that would see him run as an independent in 1910. My guest today who will speak to us about Gunnell's career is Mullingar-based journalist Dr Paul Hughes. He holds a PhD in history from Queen's University Belfast and his doctoral thesis explored the Irish Republican activism of Gunnell. From March to July 2021, Paul held the post of Westmead County Council Decadive Centenaries Historian in Residence. He works as sports editor with the Westmead Examiner and contributes regular history columns to that newspaper. Right, Paul. So we're in 1910 and the general election, two general elections that year. But uh, Gunnell, despite his, his background and his, his activities to this point, there was a concerted effort in the county to try and put an end to his... Uh, to put an end to his political career effectively, is that the case? That's correct. Uh, yes, from about 1908 onwards, after he was released from, from prison for his ranch war activities, um, he was accused by uh, what he and his supporters termed the clique in Mullingar, which would have been the Westmead Examiner editor and proprietor John P. Hayden and some of his supporters. He was accused of basically encouraging, for uh, want of a better phrase on their part, Sinn Féinism in, in okay. United Irish League circles and of, of trying to uh, trying to cause division and splits uh, in in the North West Mead United Irish League. He and his supporters were, of course, regularly known as factionists. So basically, by degrees, after he got out of jail in about April 1908, there were efforts locally to... Uh, to challenge his his position as MP, and all of this culminated in uh, well, initially in in the national convention of the of the United Irish League in 1909, that famous Baton Convention, where he and where Ginell and William O'Brien and other other critics of the uh, the the party hierarchy, if you like, were uh, expelled from that convention, and from there on. Ginnell, in his own diaries at the, at the time, described himself as keeping himself painfully close to the party. But he was under intense pressure because of his views on uh, ranching and his views on, on where the Irish party should be uh, going in the long term. Uh, he came under intense pressure to, uh, from, from Hayden and his supporters. Um, eventually, they put up a man against him, Patrick McKenna, who lived in Streamstown. Uh, he was originally from Longford. They put up a man against him at the at the December 1909 convention, and uh, McKenna was selected as the Irish Party's man for the January 1910 elections. Ginnell stood as an independent nationalist. He was funded largely by his local organisation or, or uh, branches of the UIL that were loyal to him, and also by his brother, who was a, a an unbelievably successful engineer, civil engineer based in China. Uh, so his brother sent home hundreds of pounds, which is a lot of money these days, to basically fund his election campaign. And against the odds, yeah. he survived the January 1910 election, and he was uh, a defeated McKenna by about 617 votes. Now, of course, there was a, a, an election then in December 1910, and uh, uh, Ginnell was left alone. Um, Redmond, I think, at, at national level decided that there wouldn't be much difference 
uh, in the Irish Fort between January and December. So uh, instead of putting up McKenna against him again, uh, there was a decision taken to uh, uh, to leave the Irish uh, the, the Irish seats as they were, and Ganell, of course, was returned, and he held that seat until he left uh, what was subsequently known as the Long Parliament, which uh, was extended because of the First World War. He held that seat until he left of his own accord in July 1917. So we're after 1910, the elections of 1910, we're into 1911 and I suppose we're beginning the real high point of his political career. Can you explain how he made a name for himself in 1911 and in, in the years subsequent to that? Yeah, he, he basically, his his association with advanced nationalists, if you like, um, became more pronounced during this period. He was still kind of this, it, it's hard to define his relationship with the party because he'd, he'd been expelled so many times, but they were kind of trying to ask him back at, at, at some stages. And he said, you know, no, maybe not. You know, so it's, it's kind of this undefined mm. relationship with the party. But, but pretty much for all intents and purposes, in January 1911, he was out on his own. Yeah. Um, and basically, he for the next four or five years uh, into the First World War period, he made every attempt to, to abuse the rubrics, if you yeah. like, and the institutions in uh, in Westminster, and to uh, turn to to present a different view of uh, Irish uh, or a different Irish nationalist opinion. Um, he started in January 1911 by accusing the Speaker of the House of Commons, who was a man called James Lowther, of uh, partiality and of uh, sticking to basically lists that were given to him by the parties. So that, that uh, they'd say, well, we want such a one to speak on a certain topic. And the, he'd use these lists to the exclusion of others. And Ginell, as, as an independent and a private member, was was very much put out by this. And it caused a bit of a a, a stir at the time because he, a lot of the radical liberal, uh, uh, the, the English members who were uh, liberals, but of the radical wing of the Liberal yeah. Party, actually supported him. And one, Josiah Wedgwood, uh, in private, sent him a letter which Ganell naughtily went to the Midland Reporter and uh, printed it. And that caused another uh, outbreak of consternation in the House of Commons, and he was expelled for a week. Basically, that's that's the um, the sort of the template he followed for the next few years, trying his best as a, as a not, not someone who's going against the, the Home Rule agenda, which was building at the time, but some, someone who, who uh, wanted to find avenues to push the, the the more advanced nationalist line in in Parliament and to embarrass the British whenever he could. On that point, for in 1911, he shared a platform with Patrick Pearson and, and other figures who were in opposition to um, the visit of the uh, sitting monarch, uh, British monarch King George to Ireland. Was that typical of these activities? Yes, that, and that that was a. He, before that, he had. I think the, the he was involved with the Irish Literary Society in London, and in 1910, when uh, Edward the Seventh died, uh, members of the the Literary Society in London decided, or some of them suggested, that the meeting, their monthly meeting, should be postponed because of the king's death. And he was part of a, a, a clique on, in the society who said, "Well, hang on a second now." And then the following year, he, he adopted this more kind of outright anti-establishment, uh, anti-monarchy position, and uh, just to set himself aside from the, for want of a better yeah. word, bourgeois nationalists. So that Dub that meeting in Dublin was his next time, and here he he met people like like Connolly, and it's difficult to difficult to pinpoint yeah. source wise when he met them first, but it's as early as. As the summer of 1911, he's associating with the likes of Connolly and with Pierce, and uh, you know from other sources you'll, you'll find that uh, his wife Alice, of course, was was yeah. uh, re regularly meeting with friends with Constance yeah. Markovich, and so you know the the connections there are are happening at this stage. You also mentioned that um, he was never a member of the IRB, but he had friendships and connections going back even to 1905, 1906. So what was, what was the nature of those? Was it just for political? Well, he, he joined the Ancient Order of Hibernians in 1905, and I think that was mainly for uh, political reasons. He was looking for, obviously, a seat in Westminster. He intent, uh, intended to go forward for North West Mead. So 
it was basically to, to form connections within the party. He had an opportunity during the 1880s. He spoke uh, at, at a number of literary societies in Dublin and, and a number of people who would have been attending these meetings. These would have been fertile recruiting yeah. rounds for the IRB, but he never really, he never really made the jump. I don't think he was, he was comfortable with secret societies or even discrete societies. And just before we talk more about advanced nationalism, his role inside when he's in Parliament from 1911 onwards, he's also pushing causes such as women's suffrage. He's quite out outspoken and seems to be a genuine supporter on that of women's suffrage. That issue is that accurate? Absolutely, yeah. He 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 certainly. I mean, the uh, suffrage campaigner would have cited the, the special, if you like, political treatment he was given uh, when he was in prison during the ranch war as an example of as to why they should be uh, have, uh, you know, uh, be treated as political prisoners. And he represented their case. I think the Tullamore prisoners in, in uh, 1912, 1913, he, um, he pushed their case very hard in Westminster. Alice was, of course, very connected as well herself to uh, suffrage campaigners. There, there was a limit to to their, uh, yeah. if you like, feminism. I, I would say both both Lawrence and Alice. They, they, certainly, in in um, pieces I've read about Alice in the past, there was there were limits to her associations with them. I think she saw some of the the suffrage campaigners as as a bit extreme, which is which is funny considering what they want. It went on to themselves, uh, yeah. and, uh, being being anti treatyites as well as you know, as well as Sinn Feiners, but uh, yeah, it's certainly, they were, they were both, you could consider them as Catholic conservatives. And um, I think, uh, I think it's, it's, it's Senia Pasteta's work on um, uh, Irish nationalist women, there's references to yeah. um, Alice being in, in Constance Markovich's circles and talking about all this kind of uh, bohemian lifestyle and not being, not being too happy with it. But he certainly pushed, pushed them hard in Parliament. Um, and certainly, certainly harder than any of his his erstwhile colleagues in the Irish Party would have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so, by the outbreak of the First World War, he's he's really established that template of how he acts in Parliament and also his his reputation. And then you have the the outbreak of war. He opposes Irish recruitment to the British Army. Absolutely. From and it's it's you go through his, his diaries and his, his letters at the time. It's 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 a matter of huge personal risk um, to him politically. He does not know in the summer of 1914 how the war, uh, how opposition to the war, if you like, is going to yeah. be received by his constituents who are foremost in his mind. Um, there was that kind of a there was a period where there was a rush to war and everyone was uh, kind of looking at, at it as an adventure and mm. an opportunity and of course you have the home rule aspect to it in the background as well um but i think as 1914 dragged on into 1915 and it was clear that the war wasn't going to be over by christmas Ginell felt a little bit freer to um to vo voice it and voice it in parliament and of course as 1915 went on you know the war became slightly a bit more of a quagmire um, he he just he just went for it in Parliament. There's numerous things. There was one in particular, one question he brought up um, that he had withdrawn from the the order paper, um, but it was it was some some other uh, a unionist member of Parliament got hold of it and brought it up. Uh, he basically accused um, the British of shooting unarmed German prisoners, um, and it was quite an inflammatory. Um, an inflammatory claim, but he'd he'd spend his time, you know, in the library in Westminster or walking around the halls of Westminster and talking to journalists, and he'd hear bits and pieces. And uh, if he heard anything controversial, he'd bring it up. Now he was he was absolutely he was flayed alive in the British press for that particular question. He got death threats, as many have seen the. The Ganell families uh, have extensive papers, and there's this House of Commons envelope full of these uh, uh, letters with, with death threats, both from the summer of 1915 and from 1916. And, uh, you know, so I mean, like, I, I can't I can't underestimate at the or I can't understate at this stage how yeah. well known he was. I mean, he's 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 coming towards being an international figure at this stage because 
as you said himself, there's 103 members, Irish members in, in the House of Commons and only one of them is yeah. speaking against the war. And, and that was true. And people were ta sitting up and taking notice of this. Um, you know, you had you had international, you had foreign reporters in the gallery in the House of Commons, and they were quite struck by this Irishman who was speaking in his inimitable style, uh, you know, advancing mm. a different view on the war. Um, but as I say, this had consequences for him. He, he, he got death threats. He got, but like he also he made inroads in other ways. One, one particular one to just show you how how he uh, you know tormented those in power at times. Andrew Bonner Law, of course, was the future British Prime Minister. He was Secretary of State for the Colonies at the time in the coalition, and he got word from somewhere that uh, Bonner Law's brother was the director of a, a Glasgow. Uh, uh, a firm of iron ore merchants who had been prosecuted by uh, the, the British state for trading with the enemy. So basically they were sending munitions to, to, to or uh, resources for making munitions to uh, Krupps in, in Germany. So this this was, a, this was in the Bonner Law, worked in the company himself years ago, but the fact that his brother was still involved, his brother wasn't prosecuted, but uh, it, it was a huge embarrassment to him. And if you see, if you look at uh, Herbert Asquith, the Prime Minister's diaries from the time and letters he'd written to his wife, he writes one letter to his, his wife saying that, um, he, he describing Ganell as that maniac Ganell who's going to raise in the House of Commons today about Bonner's connections to yeah. William Jackson Company. And uh, he actually says that Bonner, uh, Bonner Law was considering resigning and throwing up his political career because of it. So that'll just go to show you the, the sort of the caliber of enemies he was making. I was struck by the, that kind of incident and, and his performance in Parliament. In a way, he's almost like a crusading journalist because he's able to forensically pick out these issues and really go after them where others might turn a blind eye or not see them. Yes, that's, that's it. And, and instead of writing, instead of bringing them out in print, he's communicating them in the House of Commons in a very inimitable way that and the sort of way that gets noticed and on top of that he wrote everything all his notes for his speeches were written in Pittman shorthand and i think a lot of the journalists the international journalists in in working in the gallery in the house of commons used Pittman. so he just walk up to them afterwards and say here yeah. here's a copy of my speech and they'd go oh, great brilliant easy copy and uh he'd end up in multiple papers so I, I thought i mean if you go onto the british newspaper archive yourself you, and do a search for Ganell, you'll see fifteen thousand entries like and it's it's a it's a fairly uh unique name and you know it's not like smith or riley or whatever or jones or everything he'd said and everything he'd done was was very much in the in the international spotlight and just before we get to 1916 and this first half of the war the first world war I presume, given his stance on other issues, he's a strong critic of Dora's censorship, the defence of the Realm Act. Yes, that's a, the, the, a Dora takes up multiple uh, multiple questions uh, in 1915, and he's quite insistent on it and, and underlines constantly how Dora was being applied yeah. uniquely and specifically to Ireland in a certain way. It was being used to suppress newspapers has been used to suppress political dissent, free speech, and and he he actually got a book out of it later, uh, entitled Dora at Westminster, um, in which he uh, this is published in 1918, and it uh, basically it's uh, copies of his speeches before 1916 and and after 1916 and how he had had uh, pressed the case against Dora and its application to Ireland in in the House. The Commons. He was also he was also pushing a very and it's you know I I often hear Roger Casement described as the as one of the fathers of of Irish uh, international relations and foreign relations. Ganell was also pushing this very uh, clear and uh, and uh, unambiguous line that Ireland was a neutral country, mm -hmm. and of course this British ministers were were uh, one one in particular said that the question makes my uh, my brain reel when Ganell asked him it was Ireland not a neutral country like Holland and so he's he's ad advocating this view that the Irish are not are not at war with the Germans they're not at war with anybody they're 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 only uh, they only have one enemy 
and um, this is uh, this is this is part of the line he pushes throughout 1915 and 1916. Okay, so we have 1916. He's you've demonstrated he's at the height of his fame, and then you have the the 1916 rising, and he's actually in Ireland. He is, yeah. He's kind of over and back, and I, I toyed with the idea for a long time, and I can't, I couldn't prove it definitively that he knew it was happening. Um, and and I, I'm not sure he did, but he certainly he was as of September 1915. I think he was sitting in yeah. meetings of the of the executive of the Irish Volunteers. Um, he got he got a postcard from Patrick Pierce at Christmas. Mm with a very kind of militaristic theme to it. And uh, I, there's another letter to Sean T. O'Kelly in, in early 1916. Ganell had been given a, a, a poem by uh, Egyptians he had represented in Parliament. It was in Arabic and O'Kelly was facilitating a translation of this. He was getting somebody to translate it. And uh, there's a letter from Ganell to O'Kelly saying, make all the use you can of me in the good cause. And this is weeks before the, the rising. It's debatable whether he knew about it. He certainly, I'd say, he certainly would have known that there was something in the works. When it happened, he was in Mullingar and he tried to get the train back to Dublin. Ended up, I think he got, he got a taxi with uh, Oliver St. John Gogarty, and the two of them got as far as uh, Cabra Road, and the car was shot at. And uh, they were stopped at by uh, stopped by volunteer sentries, and uh, uh, the, the sentry realised who it was. And they brought him through the city and eventually got him to, he had to stay in Dunleary or Kingstown as it was at the time until the Wednesday night. And I think, I think, I don't know, but I think he left on the ship that brought the uh, Sherwood Foresters over. Uh, and I think he went back. Now, I'm not sure if it's a military ship they came on, but I certainly it's, there's a, there's a chance that he went, if they, they came on a civilian ship, he went. He might have gone back on that to to England uh, to the the House of Commons. He was trying to get back for a meeting of a secret session of the House of Commons, where he believed that conscription was about to be imposed on Ireland. So he was trying to get back for that. So that's that's where where he was uh, during during Easter week. And then in the aftermath, can you explain? Because he's he's a relent he's relentless figure in the uh, House of Commons. After you know, from the from, as soon as he arrives back in, can you explain his role over the next few months and weeks and months? Yeah, he, he's. Um, I, I don't have the figures in front of me at the moment. I, I have a table in my in my PhD thesis. I think it's something yeah. in the region of twelve hundred speeches and and contributions to debates he made during nineteen sixteen. His his role at this time basically is to uh, is to gather information, and to to basically what he what he becomes is a publicity conduit for the volunteers, such as they are, because they're just they're 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 scattered at this stage. They're in prisons in in the UK. The leaders are executed. The uh, everything the IRB the volunteers the volunteers are all over the shop at this stage. So what what he is at this point is. A publicity conduit for what happened, what has just happened, and you know that this is something that this is a statement yeah. of of what Ireland thinks of of uh, of British rule, and you know he's trying to basically for the next six months communicate that. So he's he's Alice at the time was working for the um, the Irish National Relief Fund in London with Art O'Brien, so. Yeah. Their role, obviously, is to collect money and send it back to Ireland. And what Ganell does is he's appealing for uh, information that he can bring to them and to the House of Commons. So any stories he hears, he's basically bringing them to Aspect and saying, well, look, I, hear, I think he he heard one story at the time. And it's, it's, <laughs> I, I, I think it's uh, I don't think it actually happened, but he claimed that uh, 50 uh, volunteers had been shot dead summarily shot at Richmond mm -hmm. Barracks. So he's bringing this to Asquith and Asquith is kind of, Asquith genuinely doesn't have a clue what, yeah. what's going on in Ireland. He goes there, I think on the 12th of May. Um, but before that, he's, he, he has no, and Ganell yeah. just has free reign to just throw these questions and, you know, questions, they're barbed questions. They're, they're, uh, you know, he, he's basically he's not he's not asking. He's saying this is what happened and this is what you're doing. 
And there's actually, uh, uh, I, I want to thank Dahi O'Karan in, in Dublin City University for this. He, he uh, found it in, in the Parliamentary Archives in Westminster. There's a letter from, uh, or a, a briefing, I think, from Herbert Samuel, who was the British Home Secretary at the time, um, to uh, the King, King George, uh, George V. And um, the, basically it's his daily briefing and he's talking about Ganel's questions in Parliament and I, I'm going, I'm paraphr uh, paraphrasing him here now, I'm not, I'm not quoting him directly, but he basically says to the King that uh, while, while it's recognised by everyone in the House of Commons that uh, Ganel, Mr. Ganel is not in control of his faculties, there may be a chance that people on the outside, that that's not their point of view, you know, that basically that people might be drinking up this propaganda as he sees it. So that, that you know, that's where, that's where, where he is in 1916. He is, he's trying to put together for the public eye what just happened and what this means for Ireland. And, you know, one of the other powerful things he comes up with is what the what Irish party yeah. veterans always maintain was a lie. Um, yeah. He claimed that mem members of the Irish party cheered the news of the executions. It's very difficult to uh, prove this without audiovisual evidence. This stuck. And Daryl Figgis, writing later in, in 1917, maintained that this was one of the, the the cries, the rallying cries, if you like, that turned people against the Irish party. He also, apart from the acting as this public conduit, he's he's gone visiting prisoners in the aftermath and getting information and giving them information as well. Isn't that correct? He is indeed, yeah. Um, some, some of them uh, didn't know why he was coming or what he was doing. I think one, I think it's uh, James Cavanaugh, I'm not sure, worked, he said he was quite happy that they, they knew Larry was a friend and they were happy to see him. Um, so they'd be going, he'd, he'd go to multiple prisons and, and uh, basically giving them cigarettes and exchanging letters and he'd bring back letters to their families. And uh, I think Tomás Malone, who was, of course, from Terrell's Pass and would have taught Ginell Irish at one stage or tried to teach him. He, he described him as the GPO. So this name kind of stuck to him. And he was, there's lots of stories in, in prison reports about him being carried around yeah. parade grounds. And, and uh, there's uh, this letter, one letter I saw from Michael Collins uh, described a visit by him. And, and you know, they were, they were all, all delighted to see him. So it was much keep, it, it was as much keeping up their morale as, as it was, uh, you know, yeah. getting information. But, I think during that stage, he's getting an idea of what's coming down the tracks. These are the future leaders. When these men arrive or, or emerge from prison, they are going to be the next generation of 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 leader. And he he carries that kind of into nineteen seventeen. Then in in the way he he conduct him, conducts himself. Yeah. Of course, these prison uh, visits are eventually stopped, and uh, he's. Um, I think he went to Nutsford Barracks in Cheshire and signed himself in Osquelga with his Irish name. And there's a whole court case then it follows that and, and uh, with him him pleading not guilty and uh, the the Gaelic League take up his case and pay for pay for his legal fees and eventually he's sent to prison and or he's fined and uh, with a prison sentence in lieu of the fine and he doesn't pay the fine and the Metropolitan Police in London turn up at his, his house in Richmond looking for furniture to take in lieu of the fine and they get no joy there so eventually he goes to prison for a week and that adds to his whole you know he, he wasn't involved in the rising but here I am I'm going to prison lads I'm I, this is I'm sacrificing too so that that adds to his his uh, you know his appeal and you know ups the propaganda I mean propaganda is the the central what would you say his his main contribution during this time? And that note, we get to 1917 now, and he, of course, he ends up joining Sinn Féin. But during by-elections in, in that period and afterwards, some of the Sinn Féin publicity and propaganda literature is effectively pamphlets that are just long quotations from uh, Ganel's speeches in the House of Commons. Yes, basically, that's a nationality, which was Arthur Griffith's paper at the time, would have followed him closely. And, and Griffith was... Mm. Uh, I think described him uh, as 
having having more a uh, more a level of moral courage like he had never seen before. But yeah, they, basically it's and it's it's why you know I mean we talk a lot we hear a lot of talk about the by elections and how crucial the by elections were and they were they, they were crucial particularly North Roscommon and and South Longford and East Clare you know these are you know milestones huge milestones and and really signalling the the death of the Irish Party if you like but we ne- we never hear about Ganell's defection yeah the fact that the Northwest Mead seat in the in the uh, House of Commons turned tur- Sinn Fein and uh, you know that's that's significant but. Most of all, again, what I said about propaganda, his that's his his main drive during this time. And he's also what I said to you earlier about uh, his visits to the prisons and realizing that this was a generation of leader coming down the tracks. You see, uh, Michael mm-hmm. Laffin's uh, account of Sinn Féin at the time and the development of the reconstitution of Sinn Féin as a Republican party. Count Plunkett, who Ginell would have campaigned for, uh, extensively during North Ross, the North Ross Common election and John Burke would have spoken a lot about that. Count Plunkers kind of developed this kind of, uh, uh, what would you say, uh, an ambition at the time to become the leader of, uh, you know, whatever was coming together. Wasn't Sinn Féin at the time. Was, I think he founded these Liberty Leagues. And, you know, Ganell himself, you have to admire him because if anyone had a, a real excuse to to adopt a, a kind of a man of destiny context, it would have been him, given his position in 1916, and the fact that I give you one example that one of the uh, one of the American news, the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, or the, I beg your pardon, the San Francisco Leader, who would, which would have been edited by Father Peter York, um, yeah. described uh, uh, one of the archbishops. I think it's um, Archbishop Walsh as the most popular man in Ireland. And Lawrence Ginnell is a good second, and another American paper described him as uh, you know the Irish Party being bankrupt, and uh, you know they they would lose elections from top to bottom. The only man who would regain his seat would be Lawrence Ginnell. You know, so they, this yeah. there's every opportunity for him there to 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 build up this kind of a, a man of destiny complex, but he's not. He's he's a unifier or a uniter, as George W. Bush might say. Um, you know, he's. He's a unifying force and he's bringing people together and he's saying, you know, these people coming out of uh, of the prisons are our leaders and we have to, everything has to crystallize about them. So then mm. he goes on to South Longford and uh, East Clare, where there's two, uh, Joe McGuinness and Eamon de Valera are elected. And these are two, of course, internees. And, uh, you know, that, that eventually leads to... Uh, Sinn Féin crystallising in October 1917 with the convention, where Ganell is elected a joint treasurer of the party. And then I'll just stop you there for a second. Uh, usually when you read about Ganell, the fractious elements of his personality are stressed and he's often considered to be a lonely or isolated figure. But from what you're saying and, and from some of the articles you've written, at, at least at this point in his career, he's he's not an isolated figure or a lonely figure to any degree. He's a leading figure in a national movement and he's known internationally. Also, you know, at this time he gets welcomed into Sinn Féin. He becomes uh, that party's uh, treasurer. Uh, But how is he greeted in the party with his background in land agitation and and, and so on? Is he welcomed with open arms or is there a certain wariness or uncertainty about him? I, I, I think central to his character is his impulsiveness and his belief, uh, nearly a tunnel vision that he's right, you know, and that 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 can cause difficulties for him. So that's that's going to rub up everybody the wrong way. And he, you know, it's a credit to him that he was yeah. a unifying force at that time. But he, in no circumstances was he he could be a leader in some ways, a leader by example, if you like. But in terms of someone who sit down to build something. And to build, you know, when you're building something, it always involves a little bit of compromise somewhere along the way. Absolutely not. The the Irish Convention in 1917, which was called by uh, to to discuss the Irish question, I think it was uh, was it George Russell uh, was brought in, if you like, to represent the Sinn Féin view. Because there was no way the British were going to sit down and try and talk to Larry Ganell about, you know, and in some ways he might have been the obvious one, but but not. They just got, you know, oh, they, they, he can rub up people in Sinn Féin the wrong way as well sometimes. 
uh, from October 1917, he basically uh, he tries to infuse Sinn Féin with this uh, radical agrarian streak, and you see him going around the country. And there's a real danger at that time. There's a real fear of uh, uh, spreading social unrest. Um, you know, there's already unrest in Russia. There's unrest in Europe. The British are fearing this, and the last thing they want is an explosion of agrarian violence across Ireland. Um, because you know, it, it, if it goes to Ireland, it might be long before it ends up in 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 the cities of London. You know, and I should say, worry of that aspect of his of his part of his political makeup as well. Partly, I'd say when you know the RAC spent months building a case against him and eventually put him away for uh, encouraging cattle driving. Um, and I would safely say there are certain people in Sinn Féin on the right of Sinn Féin, people like Arthur Griffith and, and who, you know, might necessarily have been happy to see him go to jail, but would be kind of relieved at that that side of his, his politics wasn't, uh, you know, getting the upper hand by him constantly fanning it all the time. Um, and, you know, there, there was definitely... Uh, there was, in ways, you know, what he was, the demand he was making wasn't that kind of, uh, you know, confiscatory or, or radical. Um, you know, we're not talking, we're not talking the Bolsheviks here or anything. Although he did, he did appear on a platform in February 1918, con congratulating the Bolsheviks on the, on the, the, you know, consolidating the revolution in Russia. He did, but I think as, as time went on, he might have regretted that given, Given what, and but you you read his writings at the time on what he wanted in terms of land reform, he was talking basically that anyone with over fifty acres of land uh, should be subject to to redistribution laws brought in by Sinn Fein. So you're talking about a certain upper tier of land ownership. You know, he's not coming in saying you know everyone you, you were having property swept away and everything like that. It's very kind of very limited. But uh, even that would be too much for uh, for some people in Sinn Féin. I'd say they would have been happy to see him off the scene by, for for a while. And of course, he spends the best part of the next two years in prison. That's it, in and out of prison. And then we have the, um, can you explain the, the background and his success? Because it was a resounding success in the 1918 general election. Yeah, it 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 was, and it was it was done. You know, again, we have Hayden here, and John P. Hayden as the as the, you know, the his main his main enemy, um, if you like. You know, Hayden had been just hammering away from about mm. early nineteen seventeen onwards, everything he could, every morsel of information he could get. He got a, he got hold of a letter, I think, at one stage, that uh, Ginell had sent to Horace Plunkett in. 1899, before he ended up getting a job in the United Irish League, he was looking for a job in uh, the new Department of Agriculture. So, government job. So, Hayden got hold of this letter. I don't know who, somebody leaked it to Hayden from the Department of Agriculture and, and technical instruction as it was. And it was put to, put in the Freeman's Journal first and then Hayden dragged it through the examiner as well and and tried to make a scandal out of it, also made the point, tried to allege that Ginell was still collecting his for his £400 salary from the House of Commons and this kind of stuff. So try, trying to hurt him in any way possible. But it clearly doesn't work um, because the, the Sinn Féin just swept the boards in, in Westmead as they did in many areas across the country. I think the Irish party were weak. The candidates they fielded against uh, Ganel Weems, Patrick Weems, who was the, the the Irish Party candidate, was was uh, yeah. he, he really a weak enough candidate, and, and was seen. I, I think is it Michael McCoy's Bureau of Military History witness statement says um, he was regarded as someone who was doing work for the British Army and and had been yeah. supplying them with meat, and they used to call it Weems as <laughs> hairy bacon. So in terms of a, a character. And a, and a candidate who would have been easy to attack, you know, or easy to undermine, Weems was it. The, I think the Irish party missed... Uh, and this yeah. is only, sorry, this is only five, six months after the conscription crisis, so he doesn't seem to be a particularly well-thought-out candidate to be put forward. No, no. And actually, you know, when uh, James King, who was Ganell's father-in-law, there's, uh, 
talks about in his, some of the confiscated letters you see in the police reports um, about Athlone being a difficult area for Ganel to organise. And, you know, if the Irish party had any sense, they might have found someone in Athlone who maybe they just didn't have anybody. But then, you know, they could split, at least split his vote or at least, you know, substantially weaken his vote. Now, it might have made a difference because you'll have plenty of people in Athlone who will have voted for Sinn yeah. Féin. But it would have been a far more realistic, uh, you know, proposition if they had got someone from that end of the county. Because, you know, mm. even to this day, everyone votes in that everyone's in that loan and vote at loan and everyone in Mullingar vote Mullingar, you know, and it's, you know, that kind of parochialism. They could put, they, they, they put weems up against Ganel and, you know, they might as well have been putting a donkey up against him, really. Uh, and, you know, Hayden, Hayden continues the, 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 the attacks in the paper. Of course, Ganel is supported by the Midland Reporter, although to a lesser extent, because Jasper Tully, who owned the Midland Reporter, uh, decided wanted to run against Count Plunkett in North Common, and uh, Ganel went with Plunkett, uh, and of course that affected their relationship. But Hayden, Hayden kept chipping away, but to no avail. And then, of course, the examiner, after December 19, 1918, becomes suddenly dead neutral. They they don't they don't criticize the British Army during the War of Independence really because they're afraid of suppression. But there's no more attacks on Sinn Fein or Ganel, and there's no more kind of undermining the way they did. So that's it was a little victory a victory for for uh, Ganel locally uh, a local victory if you like from the from his prison cell. That brings this episode of our podcast series to a conclusion. In our next episode, we'll again talk with Dr. Paul Hughes and discuss the remainder of Ganel's career, particularly the first all Aaron, the War of Independence, Ganel's work in the United States and Argentina and the Civil War. Thank you.